Good morning, Robin. Good morning, everyone. Hope everyone's having a lovely spring day, uh, wherever you are and whatever spring means to you. Uh, I do want to thank uh, Robin and her team for the opportunity. Um, the USDA Forest Service, uh, Michigan State, Ohio State, and EAB University for this opportunity to get this information out in front of folks. And thank you all for taking time out of your very, very busy schedules. So with that, we'll go through. Um, and as Robin said, if you have questions, we can type them in and we'll address them towards the end. Um, and with that, we'll, we'll move on. So I, I modified the title just a little bit uh, from the original, and this is just dealing with ash trees, uh, when to climb and when to work and what, what to do if you can't. One of the reasons I changed the title is that, as we're finding out, it's not just the dead ash trees that are causing us concerns. Even trees that appear uh, healthy and appear fully functional um, are, are, having, uh, are causing us some issues. So just a brief overview. <clears throat> I want to focus on the basics. One of the key takeaways from this is that the graded wood strength increases risk for the work that we do. And as we go through, you'll see that uh, as with other trees or dead trees in particular, uh, you know that there's an issue. And sometimes with the ash trees, they look healthy, but there's a, actually been a, a chemical change at the, at the wood level that's made the tree unsafe to work with. So just kind of a, a key reminder. And then think about reducing your exposure. There's risk in everything we do, but we wanna look at, is the work we're doing gonna increase or is it going to decrease the risk or exposure to it? We're gonna look at some of the techniques that are available to us um, and some of the specific equipment that we will use. So I will use a couple of key points, um, and I was uh, strongly influenced, as many of you were, by the late Dr. Alex El Shago. And Dr. Shago during a presentation would have a couple of key messages that he would repeat. So I will start with my key points and I will end with them. Um, and I'm always looking for ways to simplify the message. So the first key point um, I'd like you to remember is the number zero, meaning in terms of time frame before you even can see that there's been any issue with the, with the ash tree, um, if it's visually uninfested, there's already strength loss in the, in, the, in the wood. So before you even think it's there, there already is strength loss. Within the first one to two years, we have significant strength loss. We'll show this from some research that's been done. Um, so again, zero is the first thing before you even know it. The emerald ash borer is in the tree and weakening it. Within the first one to two years of infestation, most of the trees are suffering a significant strength loss. And this next one, it keeps changing. This is a moving target. One third, and you see I have an asterisk there. Uh, people often ask, what, when is it safe to climb or work in an ash tree? And so we're, we've been looking for some uh, sort of magic number, or magic formula, if you will, that tells people when it's safe. The problem is, as you know, with dealing with trees, there is no hard and fast rule. Uh, so we're looking at now when we see one third of the crown dying back from emerald ash borer, uh, somewhere, some, sometime before that is probably when we need to be concerned. So this number will probably change over time, but the key is remember, before you even see it uh, at, z at time zero, the tree is already structurally weakened between one to two years, there's significant strength loss. And if you're gonna climb in it or work in it, um, when you see a third of the crown or more being impacted, you should definitely reconsider. Uh, if you are climbing an ash tree in an area that is known to have emerald ash borer, think that if you want to have uh, your climbing line over a limb and around the, the main stem, and this is one of those things that used to be in the Z133, and for whatever reason in the 2017 revision, that language fell out. It will likely come back in 2022, but make sure that the branch, uh, sorry, that the rope climbing line goes around the trunk and over at least a three-inch diameter limb which ties to the, the next point, and my math isn't very good, but five, inch, five inches equals one inch. On an infested uh, ash tree, a five inch limb breaks with the same force as a one inch limb on a healthy ash tree. So that three inch limb is just a, a, a precautionary measure, but the, the number that should scare everyone is that five to one. So again, a five inch diameter limb in an infested ash tree will break with the same force as a one inch limb on a healthy. The last is zero, and that is the number of dead ash trees we should be climbing. 
Um, and I'll give you some examples a little bit later. So the key points is zero in terms of time before you even see indications that uh, emerald ash borer is in, in a tree, that the, it's in there and the tree is already being weakened. Within one to two years, most trees suffer significant strength loss. You should be thinking about not putting a climber in a tree if there's a third of the uh, canopy is showing dieback. If you do climb um, in a healthier ash tree in an infested area, make sure your climbing line goes around the trunk and over a limb that's at least three inches in diameter. And remember that in infested trees, a five inch limb breaks at the same force as a one inch, and zero is the number of dead trees we should be putting climbers into. So a little bit of an update of where Emerald Ash Borer is, and you'll see this is from December 3rd of 2018. Uh, the spread has been pretty consistent. I've looked to see an, an update, and there has been one update uh, just yesterday. So here's the spread as of April of uh, 2019. And if you toggle back and forth between the December and April, there's not a big difference, but um, if you look closely, there's a few counties in Missouri that have now um, identified emerald ash borer as being um, present. So this is updated usually every couple of months, and if you want to take a peek to see where the insect is, this is a, a good place, and I'll give you some, some resources to uh, locate some of this information. And on that, um, there's some things, the, as Robin mentioned, Emerald Ash Borer University has a lot of information. Uh, Emerald Ash Borer Information Network, uh, you can see the, uh, the link here. Lots of good information. Um, addition, I'll be referencing a couple of papers, uh, primarily one from 2013 from the uh, ISA's Agriculture and Urban Forestry Journal by Dr. Prasad and others looking at uh, the effects of emerald ash borer on some material properties of ash trees. Additionally, another paper that is helpful, it gives you a little bit of a sense of the history, as one by uh, Dan Herms and Deb McCullough that uh, was up in 2014. So some of the information I'll be providing has come from those two papers as well as uh, the other sites listed. I always like to do a little bit of history as well. So moving into um, the issue with emerald ash borer, just a little bit of history as I mentioned. Uh, the first time it was identified was actually in 2002 in Michigan um, in Ontario. Kind of the Detroit area was the first place it was seen. And that was, uh, the, it was seen in 2001 and they've indicated that the, the borer actually probably showed up in the area probably in the late uh, or mid 1990s, uh, but we did start seeing the effects and we definitely didn't identify it. It wasn't until 2002 um, that Slovakian um, entomologist was able to identify the insect. Um, and at this point, then I, I see different estimates, but billions of ash trees have already been impacted. And we do know that there's a 99, greater than 99% mortality in ash trees of greater than one inch. Effectively, when this moves into an area, um, if nothing is done, if no treatments are done, all of the ash trees uh, are going to die. The other aspect of it is just the uh, impacts it has on the environment, I issues dealing with plant communities, with stream quality, even with uh, quality of life. There's been some in indication that uh, with loss of ash forest, there's a decrease in people's health that are surrounding that area. So a significant problem. A little touch on the life cycle of the insect. The adults emerge in early summer, and that depends on what time of year or where you're, or sorry, where you're located, what time they come out. They start by um, feeding on the leaves. They need, to, they need to feed for a couple of weeks before they can um, mate and begin to lay their eggs. Females lay one egg at a time um, in little uh, gaps or pits in the bark. The larvae begin to tunnel in the cambium layer and they will remain there for one to two years. And the difference is most times if the tree is stressed, and this is one of the cases where the uh, insect is, attacked, is attracted to stress trees, the stress trees, uh, the insects will run their cycle in one year. If the tree is fairly healthy, the insects will uh, overwinter and feed a second year. So it depends on the health of the tree, how, how quickly they impact it. And the way they do this is the sort of death by 1,000 cuts theory. You know, each of these insects is very small, but the uh, number of, of eggs that are laid, the number of larvae that are feeding, cause enough damage to disrupt water flow and um, flow and transport. And we start seeing some, as I mentioned, some chemical changes in the wood. 
The adults come out with the classic uh, D-shaped holes. You've probably all seen that if you're working the areas where they're at. So let's take a look at some of the signs. You'll see the uh, serpentine pattern um, and depicted on the right. The, they'll be filled with frass uh, from the uh, insects feeding and the, the tunnels get bigger as the insects get bigger, but they'll wind back and forth <clears throat> about a quarter inch in diameter. The D-shaped holes from the adults are about an eighth inch diameter, and you can see an adult next to a, a, a dime there for comparison in terms of size. Some of the symptoms you'll see, you will, the first damage that happens is the feeding on the leaves. You won't likely see that. Most of this occurs in the upper canopy and the outer uh, branches, but you will start to see um, possibly some yellow and thinning of foliage once they start getting into the wood. You will see some canopy dieback, uh, some epicormic shoots as you see on the right, uh, and some longitudinal bark splitting, most often at the base of branches, and you see the picture on the uh, upper right there. That's one of the indications. The tree might look perfectly healthy, but when you see those cracks, uh, you can be um, certain that EAB is in the tree. Uh, you'll see some bark starting to flake. You'll see woodpecker woodpeckers attacking it. Um, so all these are some of the symptoms that the insect is uh, attacking the tree. Uh, questions come up in the past about what, what do we look for in treated trees? Because some people are treating trees on a regular basis. Um, we want to know what if we have to prune or remove one of these trees. So we want to do an evaluation uh, similar to other trees that haven't been treated. But in addition, we want to be looking at the injection sites. Um, even though we've been treating them, the insect could be in the tree. So take a look, take a close look at the injection sites. And if you see cracks and decay around the injection site, that's an indication that the uh, insect is getting ahead of the treatment and the tree might be a greater risk than you thought initially. So the, so as I mentioned, some of this comes from some of the research from uh, Dr. Nan Prasad, who's uh, pictured in the right there. Um, as the insect feeds in the tree, there's a whole process of chemical and physical changes that happen as they work their way through. So they're not only disrupting water flow and, and flow and transport, uh, there's actually some chemical changes to the wood and most of this occurs in the, in the cameo layer. They found up to 300 beetle larvae uh, from a 15 to 21 inch diameter tree, so a lot of insects working their way through, and you see the picture in the lower right, uh, almost the entire circumference of the tree has been uh, damaged by the, uh, by the insect feeding. So I wanna to touch a little bit on uh, Dr. Prasad's research where they looked at a couple of different classes of trees and as you see in the right, the zero year, those were trees that showed no signs of infestation, and they were also being chemically treated. Then the next group is that one to two that showed some signs of insect attack, and then sort of three years and beyond trees that showed no, um, no additional growth. So group one, they were treated with insecticide, visually uninfested, and you can see that picture of the tree looks fairly healthy. Group two, they've been infested for up to one to two years. You see dieback, you can see some of the epicormic uh, branching on the uh, main leader. And then group three were trees that have no new terminal growth. You might see some growth, but it's usually just epicormic. And often this is um, towards the base of the tree or base of larger branches. And these are trees that have been infested for two to four years. So I won't go into the details of, of how they did the research, but what they did is they applied some mechanical stresses to trees to see how, how they uh, reacted. And what they measured were uh, wood moisture and gravity, bending stresses, the fracture zone, and the fracture point location. So some of the key takeaways from the research relate to the bending stress. And if you look, you'll see from uninfested to that one to two year, you see a huge drop in bending stress, meaning there's a great strength loss uh, between those two categories. And you'll notice there is a loss of strength between a one to two year to two to four, but it's not that significant. So back to that, our uh, key factors there, before you even see the insect in the tree, it's impacting the tree strength. So within one year of infestation, we see a huge strength loss um, in those trees. A couple other things they looked at, they did look at wood moisture, and you'll see a decrease in wood moisture again from uninfested to infested. And we're finding that the amount of moisture is significant. And a question was raised a few months back about, what about ash trees that are in drier environments? 
uh, as you saw from the map, PAB is in Colorado and some of those environments are a little drier than we have in the east. And we're finding that those trees tend to succumb a little quicker because they are drier. So we do, again, we do see a strength, strength loss. We do see water moisture loss. And then um, we look at the, the sum of cracks. So we see the, the number of cracks goes up uh, more significantly from one to two to two to four. Um, the overall message here is that there's significant impacts between uninfested and infested, and especially in that one to two year level. Lastly, they wanted to look at where do branches fail? And what we find is in infested trees, the branches fail further, uh, sorry, closer to the trunk than further out than what you would expect. This is just the data from Dr. Prasad's research. And what that looks like is we see here where the uh, branch fractures, when they were loading trees intentionally, um, are, are failing much closer to the trunk than you would have expected. This is the research from a couple of years ago. Um, right now, Dr. Rasad and others are working on some uh, additional research looking at acoustical stress waves. And I uh, know enough to know that if I want more information, I will ask Dr. Prasad. Uh, what I do know in speaking to him is that they're, they're trying to use, they're using this system, uh, this acoustics meter, to measure decay and weakness um, in, in ash trees in particular. And I, I said, I don't understand all the science of it, but I know enough smart people so I can ask them what I need to. So they're looking at a, a variety of trees, trees that are standing, some trees that are standing dead, others that have fallen. And what, we're, what they're finding is that um, the acoustical transmission times, basically they you know, send a sound wave into the tree at one portion, they measure how long it takes to get to another. Uh, the, the time increases um, with decay. So a, a healthier sound a tree, sound moves quicker through it. And those of you that use a hammer to sound a tree or use some other technique to uh, thump a tree before you climb it, understand that um, you do get different uh, sound qualities. So now they're, they're able to measure this and actually get some quantitative data as well as qualitative. So it is, the system is used in other wood quality assessments. Uh, and they're, so they're, they're working on the research now. The paper hasn't been published yet. Uh, when it is, we'll obviously uh, make people aware of it. Uh, one of the, the, the frightening things with the research is that what they're finding is ash trees that are in that sort of serious decline or even still standing but standing dead and some that still show some signs of life. The uh, quality of the wood in terms of the acoustical transmission is roughly that of styrofoam. So keep that in mind when you're working around uh, ash trees that, uh, as you know, wood, wood fibers vary uh, throughout the year, frozen versus not frozen, dead versus sound, hollow versus solid. Um, but what we're finding in the ash trees is the serious decay trees, the, the wood shows similar um, sound resistance as to styrofoam. So when you see a 60 foot standing dead ash tree, think of that as a really large uh, hazardous styrofoam cup. So with that information, we want to think about, okay, what can we do to minimize our exposure to risk? There's risk in everything we do. Um, so what, what can we do to reduce that? And one, one key thing to remember is, you know, we, uh, we, we look at research that Dr. John Ball presents in terms of the nature and types of serious incidents and fatalities in the industry. And as we hopefully recall, the, usually the, the number one classification is struck by. And in 2017, which is the last year we have complete data, struck by has led the uh, overall fatality cause at just over 39% of all fatalities. And up until uh, 2017, the single leading or single greatest cause of incident was within the struck by category, and that was struck by whole tree. It used to be electricity was the single greatest killer, but in 2015 and 2016, the single greatest killer was being struck by a whole tree. And normally I would be asking for people to raise their hands and, and come up with ideas, but as this is a webinar, I'll tell you what most people come up with. And what we found is this increase in uh, whole tree felling fatalities deals with issues that are caused by things like emerald ash borer, Asian longhorn beetle, bark beetle, fire, drought. What we're seeing is we're felling larger, more hazardous trees from the ground because they are not safe to put a climber and sometimes not safe to work in. So for a couple of years, that was the single greatest uh, killer was being uh, 
struck by a whole tree. And just to round out the categories in 2017, falls accounted for 36%, electrocutions 19. Transportation uh, was a little over 6%. Assaults, which includes assault by people, assault by animals, and unfortunately, self-assaults or overdoses, a little over 1%. And then we also had about 1% of the fatalities were medically related or, or heart attacks. So thinking about ex, uh, exposure to risk. So we have risk in, in, in what we do in tree work. Dealing with emerald ash borer increases our exposure to risk. So whether working on an ash tree or near an ash tree, um, our risk is increased. So we should be evaluating the tree, the site, and whatever our work requirements are, um, if we're gonna be exposed to ash. And I'll, I'll keep pounding on this point that, doesn't matter if you're working on the ash or near the ash. Um, and remember the styrofoam analogy. We're seeing some indications that something as simple as vibration near uh, one of these trees could cause it or part of it to fail. So be thinking about your chipper, your stump grinder, even your aerial lift um, could be causing vibrations in the ground that might be enough to cause an ash tree to fail. So look at the whole site, um, check the tree you're working in, check surrounding trees, and then what are you doing? Are you pruning, are you removing? Um, and then think about how can we minimize that exposure? And then start with the most simple um, tools possible. Think about the, the easiest and safest way to get something to the ground or, or prune, whatever your, whatever your work is. Um, yeah, minimize exposure to the risk, minimize complications uh, from the techniques and equipment, and then use whatever system is going to reduce your exposure to risk. And this is something we need to remember that we always uh, have to be willing to walk away. There's no tree that's worth dying for being, um, you're having your life altered and your families and friends' lives altered forever. Uh, walk away. There's other ways of dealing with it. So remember that you have that authority to, uh, to walk away from it. One of the things I think about from the, a rigging perspective is a, a friend teaches up at Mid-State College in Wisconsin, Joe Hoffman, uh, teaches his students that you can remove a tree with a belt sander. Now people laugh when we say that, but if you're trying to reduce the forces, a belt sander would do it. Now granted, it's not efficient, but if you think, if you keep that in mind, keep the simplest tool available, and how can we reduce the risk? So if we don't want to put a climber in it, or you don't want somebody working a lop, can we fell it safely from the ground? Um, not always. Uh, because of the issue of the, the nature of the wood, the fact that it's like styrofoam, uh, felling the tree from the ground, there have been fatalities in the industry where this was attempted and the tree failed above the hinge and struck the saw operator and killed them. But if it can be safely felled from the ground, um, follow your felling plan. And people have different numbers of, of components of the plan, but follow the plan all the time. Identify all the hazards, the tree, the surrounding tree, power lines, all those things that we look at. Assess the height of the tree. Is it going to fit into the lay that you want it to go? Uh, look at the leans, forward and back, side to side. Is, it, is that going to be an issue? Think about your retreat path or escape route. Uh, can, can you get out of there if the tree begins to fail? And then what's your hinge plan? And lastly, uh, your cutting plan, your bore and back cut and then you release it. So whatever your number is, some people use six, some people use five, have a plan and follow that plan every single time. Think about the um, hinge control. This is a graphic from the OSHA website. It shows the different types of uh, openings to be used. So this is uh, something that's free for use, it's out there. Uh, the key here is, the, is identifying the hinge and setting the hinge properly and having the angle open wide enough to allow the hinge to work. So the hinge controls the direction to fall until the hinge, uh, until it breaks. So if you have a, a narrow opening, uh, the hinge will fail sooner and the tree will go wherever, wherever it wants to go. Should be placed in sound wood and the back cut actually creates the hinge. And now we know with ash, we don't have extremely sound wood, so need to be thinking about, is this the technique we can use? Beware of bypass. Uh, bypass can be one of the most hazardous things when felling a tree. You can see in the birch tree on the left, a little, there's a little bit of bypass on the down cut. The saw operator is cleaning that up. And on the right, if you look, you can see the, uh, 
the uh, bypass has actually created a new hinge. So you only have a small little space here that will um, only allow the tree to move a little bit before the hinge begins to fail. This was done intentionally to show that. Bore cuts do improve safety. Do you have to practice it? Practice, practice, practice. And we want to make sure one of the things we are worried about uh, with, with all of these trees is the bore cut does not only improve safety in general, but it virtually eliminates barber chairing. And I will attempt to, some of you have probably seen this um, on social media, but what happens when you don't uh, do your, now, now it looks like it's not a good play, I apologize, but there's a link on the bottom uh, that shows uh, somebody out west felling a rather large dead tree and uh, their escape route isn't great. The tree barber chairs and they slide back down um, almost to the base of the tree as the tree barber chairs. Fortunately, it falls away from them and does not hit them. But just a reminder of uh, the importance of setting the hinge properly and avoiding barber chairing. So if we can't fell it from the ground, um, maybe look at using an aerial lift. You know, the, it, it, it re removes some of the risk to the, the person aloft, but it doesn't uh, eliminate it. Uh, we still have had cases where trees have failed onto the, the bucket operator or on the boom, ejecting the operator and causing them to hang from their full body harness. But look at that. Can, can we reach it from a lift? Is it depending on the situation? Um, is this a private property? Is, this, is it utility? Is it a commercial? Uh, can we get a lift in there? Now we have new trucks that are taller that allow us to get further reach. So maybe that's something to look at. Can we bring a, an elevated lift in that allows us to, to get more access to it? The technology keeps improving. There's tracked lifts that are being used now uh, that allow you to access small areas. Most of these units are designed to get through a standard 36 inch gate, but yet can give you reaches of 60, 70, 80, 90 feet. One concern to be aware of uh, with these units, with the exception of a few, and you'll see the, uh, the unit on the left is actually a fully Class C insulated unit, so it meets the same uh, dielectric standards as the aerial lift trucks we saw in the previous picture. Um, but there are a lot of units that are not, that are all metal, so do not use them near power lines, and there's been cases uh, where there's been fatalities. Unfortunately, locally, there was uh, two fatalities where they used a fully conductive unit, uh, put it into the primary, and both were killed. So we do have the opportunity to get access into tighter areas with these smaller units, and the, I've seen recently the market is changing. More and more companies are offering these units in a uh, dielectric um, offering. So it gives us access to places where we couldn't get an aero lift truck, um, but it, and it also gives us the dielectric ability to insulate us a little bit from the hazards. So if you do climb or you're, you're working out of a bucket, think about managing the rigging courses. Want to reduce that uh, whenever possible. If we don't have to rig off of an ash tree, um, that's the best solution. But if we do have to rig off, think about what can we do to minimize the forces. If we can just crash and burn, cut a piece and let it fall. Now, a lot of our environments won't let that happen. If we're working over a power line, often we can't do that sometimes in nicer yards. We're not able to uh, destroy things, but look at that if that's an option to just let things fall so we're, we're minimizing the shock. So cut and toss, use the snap or bypass cut. Different ways of doing that. One of the things you make sure you want to practice before you do it so you can control the piece. But remember, you, whatever you're doing in the tree, you are applying some force. If you're climbing, your body weight becomes part of the mechanical advantage or disadvantage system, if you will, that it's applying force to the tree. And anything you do, you, even if you're using a handsaw to cut and toss, you are applying force. So think about if that limb or uh, leader is going to break, where's it gonna go? And make sure you're not in that path. So think about the direction uh, or orientation of cuts. And depending on the species and the nature of the uh, decay, you might have to adjust the distance between your cuts. So a little, some examples of the forces applied in rigging, did some work with a, a load cell. We took, uh, took a piece of wood and hung it, and the wood weighed 40 pounds, and you can see the length of the strap, lifted it up and dropped it just that distance, and that log 
generated a force of 350 pounds at the anchor point. So there's, you'll see different formulas out there. Um, easiest one to remember is at least 10. If you're shock loading, you're applying at least 10 times the force at the rigging point. It might be a little less, it might be a little more, but it's easy to multiply by 10. So if you can estimate the weight of a piece, you can estimate the weight of a shock load. Um, so that's the worst case scenario, but hopefully you're not shock loading. Uh, so avoid it. Uh, do not shock anything. Definitely stuff that shows indications of one year or more, even if it appears sound. So try to use low impact systems. And remember that these trees are often structurally weaker at the base. As we mentioned during felling from the ground, sometimes they will break above the hinge. And this is a point where they can break during rigging. So managing forces and rigging, it's really good rigging practices applied uh, to ash tree. Minimize the shock load. Um, you know, we as a group like to use the quote of go big and go home, um, but go small and definitely go home. So bigger doesn't mean better. Bigger means more force. And if we know the tree is impacted by emerald ash borer, uh, we're likely increasing the chance of it failing. Uh, good rope management, let it run. Hopefully your, your folks in the ground can manage the uh, friction through whatever friction system you're using, whatever device you're using to manage it, and hopefully you're not just wrapping the rope on the tree using one of the systems that are out there. Um, again, let it run, manage the rope, and think about that 10 times, um, average about 10 times the rigging force. Type of rope impacts it. Um, is it low stretch? Is it high stretch? Is it no stretch? I've seen people want to use uh, some of the new higher uh, strength fibers that have zero stretch because they're lighter and easier to use. But the stretch is actually good in a uh, rigging line, so don't use those fibers for rigging. And then think about the placement of rigging, um, the distance cut from the rigging point. So all of the, the basic rigging, good rigging practices apply, just the risk is greater with ash trees when we know that they are impacted by emerald ash borer. The other piece is think about vectors, think about force direction. Uh, we have the ability sometimes to use vehicles to uh, anchor from, but when we do that, we've actually put a vector force on the stem and we can have the tree fail because of that load. So whenever possible, use the base of the tree to anchor from. <clears throat> Excuse me. And then if you need to, uh, for whatever reason, need to work away from the base of the tree, redirect it off of the base of the tree. We have these huge bending forces if we're uh, not doing a redirect. So set up a simple redirect at the base of the tree would allow you to uh, control the forces with, and, and compress the fibers as opposed to bending them. In the picture on the right um, with the friction device and the come along is actually from the research. They were loading, loading the tree. I'm, I'm not advocating using a come along during uh, uh, lowering options. So a few other things we have out there um, available to us is use, the use of cranes. Cranes can be a, a good way to manage the forces, um, but as with everything else, you need to understand the risk that the cranes pose. And what we see in the industry, the, the number one risk we see in tree care and crane use uh, is tip over. And it's either improperly cribbing the crane or shock loading or overloading the crane and causing it to tip. Unfortunately, four or five times a year, you'll see come across the Google alerts, the crane tip over uh, in the industry. Um, we also have cases where uh, the tree or the crane can get too close to the lines, but cranes are an effective way to manage the force because you're lifting and you're not shocking the tree. However, you are still applying some force. So think about the forces that you are applying. And then uh, is the crane appropriate to use, to use as a tie-in point? Z133 has written um, specific specifications for how to tie in. Uh, make sure that your system complies with that. Your system can't interfere with the crane components and the crane components can't interfere with your system and the rope shouldn't uh, be damaged during the process. So there's lots of um, equipment and techniques that are out there and have been for some time, um, but the technology is changing and I like the way it's going. Uh, we uh, sort of joked about how when we, uh, as children, we watched the Jetsons that had all sorts of fancy technology telephones that you could see people, flying cars, all of that. And now it seems like we're seeing some of that. Um, some of the new technologies are allowing us to do our work safer and more efficiently. There's a variety of equipment out there that has a saw and a grapple as part of it. 
these systems are run with a remote control, so it removes the operator from the point of hazard. And in this case, it happens to be, this unit is uh, uh, the, the grapple saw is mounted on a, a knuckle boom configuration, and the operator can cut pieces, and grab and cut pieces, and then can actually even place them into the chipper, so we reduce risk on the ground as well. Um, there are some things to consider because it has a remote control that allows the operator to walk around and hopefully the operator is not putting themselves in harm's way. But this is one thing that we're, uh, one of the new tools that's out there that we're pretty excited about that uh, allows us to remove the operator from the, the, the greatest point of hazard. So if you do have to uh, climb, and there are, there are cases when we have to climb infested ash trees, um, avoid it. You know, hopefully you're, you're main managing the, the trees, and that depends on whether you're residential, municipal, or utility, and how much impact you can have and how the trees are managed. But uh, if you can, you know, the, uh, the sooner we get into trees, the, the more likely, uh, less likely we are to have them fail on us. So avoid them whenever possible. Um, think about what's your live threshold. There is no uh, industry accepted threshold, but this is something that you as an organization, whether it's company or municipality, um, or as an individual, what do you feel comfortable uh, doing? And remember that the climber does exert a load on the tree. Every time I move my 200 plus pounds up the tree, I'm increasing that load, that lever, that moment um, on the base of the tree or on the base of the limb. So think about where you tie in. Um, are, you, are you tied in on a central leader? Or are you tied in out and redirected? Are you applying vector forces or lateral? So avoid tying just into a lateral limb. Here you'd want to go um, over that limb and around the main trunk. Tie into upright stems whenever possible. Like this. And then tie into larger diameter unions. And this is one of those things where um, if you ask, is it, is it a good thing or a bad thing that we can install a rope from the ground up to heights of in excess of 100 feet? And the answer is yes, it is both good and bad. If we can't see our tie-in point, that can be a problem. One of the things that we've looked at in the Z133 is in the 2017 version, asking the climber to make sure that they see their tie-in point before they climb and preload it with some force to make sure that it's not just stuck over a small sucker and the, the rope will uh, seat down into the crotch. Tend your slack, uh, keep it minimal. We wanna minimize the force. The, the climber can create shock loads as well as a piece. An example, we had uh, a climber who weighs about 210 pounds with gear in this configuration tied into a load cell. They have their feet against the tree. They did one body thrust, pulled up about 18 inches and then just released. So they drop their body about 18 inches, but their feet is on the tree. So what force do you think was at the tie-in? So 210 pounds of climber and gear generated 680 pounds at the uh, tie-in point. That is in this scenario, when we did it with the climber uh, free hanging, they generated almost 900 pounds of force. Uh, some of you might have seen the paper uh, that was out a little while ago looking at the uh, impacts of load at the tie-in point comparing two people pulling versus uh, two different climbers climbing. What we found is the greatest load on the tie-in point was placed there by an inefficient climber. So somebody that is bouncing and allowing slack into their system. So uh, just the climber themselves can allow the, or, or can cause the tree to fail based on shock loading. So think how you manage your slack. So keep in mind that three inch uh, minimum diameter uh, Rope should go around the main leader and over at least a three inch minimum diameter. Uh, these upper branches can fail one to two years after infestation, so pay, pay close attention. They might appear sound from the ground, but you might have a different plan when you get there, so uh, make sure you have a, a backup plan. And again, over around the main stem and over at least a three inch diameter lead. Uh, and then when you get up there, double check. It might have looked good from the ground, but when you get there, you might see some cracks, you might see some other indications. And then when you're trying to decide uh, what tree to climb, uh, be thinking less than one third. Uh, again, there's no hard and fast rule. This is just something that as we're looking at things, this is uh, what, what, we're look, what we're thinking about. If it's a third uh, dead, the, crown, the third of the canopy is dead from emerald ash borer, you might want to think about some other option. 
use aerial lift or if you can fell the entire tree. Uh, some other options are out there for us as well. So if it's dead, absolutely do not climb. Remember the last zero in our five things, our five key points, uh, do not climb it. A friend who uh, does a lot of high-end work, a lot of high-risk work, they have a very good team, they have a very good plan. They used to climb uh, dead ash trees uh, under certain circumstances, and they had one that they had a plan where the climber was gonna send, notch, bore cut, leave a strap, um, they had a rope in the top, the climber was going to come down, and then they were going to pull the top over. And after the climber was safely away from the tree, they went to pull the top, and the whole tree failed at the base. So do not climb dead ash trees. So if you do have a situation where you're not comfortable climbing and you have some trees around, think about use of a skyline. Uh, can you maybe tie into a single adjacent tree, or can you set a skyline between trees? Uh, you have to be careful of the forces that you are applying to those anchor trees. It takes a fair bit of training and some different equipment, but the uh, skyline does allow you to do some things. Think again, think about the forces. Uh, redirect trees, so compress fiber and don't um, bend it. And then tie back the trees like a guy wire or antenna or pole to support the anchor point. And then watch your rigging lines. As you can see in the photo, there's, uh, it's fairly busy. There's a lot of ropes there, so keep make sure the lines are kept clear. So in summary, all trees uh, need to be approached with caution. The uh, emerald ash borer trees, um, infested trees have more risk, but think about what can we do to reduce our risk. Um, ask every time you go to do something, is this gonna increase or decrease my exposure to risk? Any ash tree uh, that has emerald ash borer in it, uh, remember they degrade significantly and quickly. So be sure to take, uh, this as part of your, your tree risk assessment and evaluation during your, your work plan. Climbing, climbers and rigging generate forces, so take that as into consideration as part of your plan. And try to use the same tree uh, to rig from, so you're not putting those vector forces and bending the tree, or redirect at the base of the tree if you have to. And then keep in mind compression and not bending the fibers because bending will cause them to fail sooner. So keep it simple. Uh, what's the simplest way you can remove this in the safest way? Um, often the, 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 the simpler it is, the, the easier it is to get done, the more complicated, the, um, the more risk we have. And then think about the human exposure to risk. You know, we don't want to damage anything, but if we have a client that, you know, maybe they didn't want their lawn damaged, but it, we can't get any of the equipment, we don't want to put a climber into the tree. Uh, maybe we just tell them, look, we're, the safest way is to drop the tree on the lawn and we'll repair the damage to the lawn. So think about minimizing human exposure to risk. Um, keep it simple. You know, the more links in the chain, the more likely that there is something to go wrong. Make sure everyone is trained on the equipment and the techniques that you're gonna use. And use things that reduce risk, not increase risk. And the last thing, and I wanted to call this out visually separate is that um, the, the, the arborist, tree worker, tree trimmer, whatever you call yourself, um, that person has the final determination. They have the right to refuse the work. If they feel that the tree is unsafe because of what they know about emerald ash borer, then it is their right and responsibility to themselves and the, their families um, to call an all stop and, and not perform the work. Find out what else can be done. Call a supervisor, call a sales rep, call the utility contact, a municipal contact, come up with a different plan. Um, too many people are dying because of uh, trees failing or uh, failing on them or failing uh, them failing with the tree. So remember our key points, zero before you see indication that the tree um, has emerald ash borer in it, it is already starting to uh, decline. Within one to two years, we see significant strength loss. Remember the graph showing that massive um, bending stress, strength loss in the first two years. Come up with uh, some, some formula for your workers so they know uh, based on what they see in a tree whether or not it's appropriate for them to climb. If they are climbing, oops, too fast, uh, make sure the rope goes around the main leader and over at least a three inch diameter limb. And in uh, five to one, an infested uh, ash tree uh, has a, a five inch limb will break with the same force that a one inch limb will break in a healthy tree. And then the 
last zero is for the number of dead ash trees we should climb. So zero, one to two, less than one third, greater than three, five equals one, and zero. And with that, what questions do you have? And again, I wanna thank uh, Robin, the USDA for providing the resource to make this available, Emerald Ashmore University, Michigan State, Ohio State, Dr. Anand Prasad, Dr. Dan Herms, um, and Don Rapolo for some slides and assistance with this presentation. So Robin, I will open it up to questions. All right. Um, thank you very much, Tim. This has been really informative. Um, we have a question from Lindsay Purcell. Are there any recommendations relative to discouraging SRT over using DRT for working aloft? Great question, Lindsay, and it's one that comes up often. Um, and one I will modify the language. We have a little inside joke here that we're, we're no longer referring to it as SRT, which used to be single rope technique. Uh, the definition and, and term that we use in Z133 is stationary rope system um, because it's, it's more than just a technique. There's a whole system. But the question is, are there greater forces applied when you're using a stationary system versus a moving system? Although intuitively we would think that the stationary system um, and the assumption is, Lindsay, that we're talking about a basal anchor where the rope is anchored at the base of the tree, it runs up across, um, over a crotch and back down. Uh, there are different stationary systems, a canopy anchor, which it, it would be tied directly. But the, what we found based on some anecdotal evidence as well as the research that Dr. John Ball and I did with some load cells that we're really not seeing the increase in magnitude of force with a stationary rope system. And back to the research that we did in South Dakota State, the, the most impact or greatest force we saw on an anchor point was from an inefficient climber on a moving rope system. So the, any system that is easier to use and requires less mo motion or less bouncing um, is going to uh, cause the least amount of force to be applied. Now, that being said, with any system, you want to make sure that the system is installed correctly, you're trained properly, all the components are designed to work together, and your tie-in point is appropriate. And as we've said in the Z133, we, we want you to see that tie-in. We do want you to load it with some force before you plot. And it, let me know if that answers your question, Lindsay. Great, thank you. Um, Lori Gruber asks, is the grapple saw safe near power lines? Great question, Lori. So the, the grapple saw that, that was depicted um, in this presentation is conductive, meaning it's metal. Um, it's, it's really just a crane, um, a knuckle boom crane with that attachment. So the answer is um, no, in a sense, that that, that device would have to maintain uh, you know, a minimum approach distance from the power lines. So that one is as conductive as a crane is. There are some units that are being developed with that grapple saw head that are gonna be mounted to a fully Class C insulated body, the same as an aerial lift. So there are some that are out there. Um, I don't believe they've hit the market. I think they're in uh, beta testing right now or prototype. So the, the unit that was showed is conductive and that would conduct electricity through the truck into the ground. So that the short answer is that one needs to be kept away from the power lines. All right. Um, Lindsay Purcell says, it, you answered his question and thanks you. Thanks, Lindsay. <laughs> um, another question here um, from Josh Grimms, is any specific guidance around tree felling in terms of modifications to felling plan coming out through experience, i.e. bigger versus smaller hinge width, thickness, et cetera? Great, great question, Josh. Um, the specific, there's nothing been specific to ash trees yet. I know that we're looking at that. I know there's the, the tree biomechanics workshops coming up here um, in a couple of months, and I think they're looking, that's one of the things they're looking at. Uh, but I'll, I'll go back to the information that we have. There's a, a study done in Sweden about 10 years ago where they looked at uh, hinge length and thickness and width and, and placement, and it's still been pretty consistent that the, what we've been teaching is the hinge thickness, meaning from the front of the hinge to the back, is should be less than 10% of the diameter at the point that the hinge is created. 
The only exception to that was as we get into larger trees, uh, over 30 inches in diameter, that study showed that uh, we may want to go a little bit thinner than that. So we've, we've not really addressed the, the decay issue because the, we just haven't had the, the, the science behind it. And there's probably some anecdotal evidence out there, but I don't know enough to speak to that. But I would say if you look back, start back with that research from Sweden is a good point. And then um, look to see what comes out after the biomechanics uh, workshop here in a couple of months. And if that hopefully answered your question, Josh. If not, I will, I'll try to do better offline. All right, thank you. We have one from Shane Bernier. Do failed ash trees bring a lesser quality of hardwood to the lumber industry and therefore bring a lesser price per board foot even before decay fungi has set in? Uh, great question, Shane. And from the paper that Dan Herms wrote, the second paper I referenced, Emerald Ash Borer Invasion, North America History, Biology, Ecology impacts and management. They do address that a little bit. And the short answer is yes. Um, because by the time, like I said, by the time we see that, that it's in there, it's already started to impact things. And we're seeing some decay. And I don't remember, I'm just kind of paging through it now, if, if they've looked at that um, specifically. This paper is from 14. I'm sure there's some newer things than that. Um, but what I've seen in the research indicates that the quality of the wood has been lessened. And so even before decay fungi get in there, the EAB is causing uh, damage to the tree. Now, it depends on how quickly it's, it gets to the mill um, and how sound the tree was. But we do know in that outer, especially the cambial region, that's where we're seeing that the, the most damage. So it, it, it depends. I know that's kind of a, not a great answer, but it depends. Okay, thank you. Um, Jerry Breton says, does temperature or drought increase the degradation, i.e. speed of decay of the ash tree? Great, great question, Jerry. And I'll answer two questions. One you didn't ask that I was going to include. Um, this winter, we had some pretty cold spells here in Northeast Ohio, uh, down to about 10 degrees uh, below zero Fahrenheit. And, and I asked the question to the research as well, that's pretty cold, won't that kill off the insect? And the answer, unfortunately, is no, um, because where this insect originates from in China, they're, they're able to super cool down to about minus 22 uh, Fahrenheit. So unless we get a minus 60 winter, and maybe Jerry up in Maine, you're seeing that, um, we're probably not gonna see the insect die from the winter. But the only thing that I know of from the research is more related to um, water. As, as the trees dry, they, they do rot quicker. So if we're not seeing adequate rainfall, as I mentioned in, in Colorado, some of those trees are growing in drier environments. We're seeing the decay spread quicker. I haven't seen any indication that temperature impacts, impacts that, but I want to just throw that out there. Um, so that I was hoping that the cold weather was going to kill them, but unfortunately not. Thanks, Jerry. All right, thank you. Um, and Josh also thanks you for your answer. He thought that was very helpful. Uh, let's see. Right now, I'm not seeing any more questions. Let's see here. Okay. Right now, I'm not seeing any more questions. Um, what I'll do um, is, if it's okay with you, Tim, is um, if people ne need to maybe ask you questions again, for they have a you know a reason to. Um, I'll make sure that your um, contact information, as far as your email, is is on the um, email that I send out. Yeah, absolutely. Feel feel free, everyone, to reach out. And based on the, the folks asking the questions, I know most of them and have their con they have in my contact. But yeah, feel free to reach out. Um, and if I don't have the answer, I I know some people that might. Okay. Uh, we do have one question from Bill Gunther. Are there any differences in working with white versus green versus black ash? Great, great question. And that's something I'd skipped over in my notes. Um, the sh short answer is no. What we find is that uh, with only one exception, most of the North American ash trees are significantly impacted by uh, emerald ash borer. And all of those mentioned uh, are are in that 99% category of once it gets in, it will, it will kill 99% of all of them. The one exception that we, we see and we don't see a lot of it is blue ash. 
there seems to be a little bit of resistance and it, it only the fatality or mortality rate is about 40% with the blue ash. But with uh, white, green, and black, we're seeing um, you know 99% uh, kill rates. Okay. Um, it looks like I'm not seeing any more questions. Um, oh, yes, I am. The minute I say that, they pop up. What species genus uh, slash genus is EAB likely to jump to in the absence of ash? Um, I can kind of answer that question. There's been numerous tests done by our researchers as far as no choice with emerald ash borer um, and different, you know, various species of trees. There has been evidence that EAB will has infested white fringe tree, and that's been in Ohio only from as far as we know, but it has not been able to actually infest and lay eggs and have larvae um, develop into EAB um, in any other species of tree now. There's just something about the volatiles that EAB emits that is the attractant to those trees. So white fringe tree is it, and we've only seen, they've, that's only been um, actually evidenced in Ohio. So, okay, I have one another question here from Robert Mills. Does EAB invade more or less vigorously in various growing environments, i.e. swamps versus uplands? It's a question from Groton, Vermont, which is newly infested. Oh, well, sorry, sorry that you're dealing with it. Um, what I found, and in, in Robin, you might have more, or might correct me on this, but what I found in the research is that it, the only difference is, is the health of the tree. The, uh, the insect is more attracted to stress trees, if there's girdling roots, if there's something else going on with the tree, they're more attracted to that, to that tree and they will move through that tree quicker. The, uh, the larvae will only spend one season there, but if the tree is healthier, they will still lay their eggs there. Um, it'll just take two years for the uh, larvae to feed before the adults emerge. And that's the only thing that I've seen is that um, it's just the overall health of the tree. So the site might um, impact that. So more, we see it more in a um, sort of urban setting. If we put a tree in an environment that's not good for it, and we do bad things to it, like plant it deep, do a mulch volcano, all of that, um, it's more likely to uh, be attacked sooner and more likely to succumb quicker. Um, other than that, I haven't really seen anything unless you have any details, Robin. Um, no, that, that pretty much explains it. Um, and there's also more information about that on the emeraldashboard.info website. If you wanna go there, there's other information there um, for, our, for our participants. There's a lot of information on, on this kind of a topic there. Um, I have been told by Cliff Sadoff that fringe tree has also been found in Indiana with EAB. So we've got two states like that. Um, and let's see, we have one here. Is Dennis Moen, at, is, are there any known resistant trees in China or another location? Um, I can tell you that the, the Manchurian ash is somewhat, um, is, is somewhat uh, um, resistant to EAB, but when you have enough EAB in an area, it has also been known to be infested. It's probably, in, will have the least amount of infestation over other ash trees there. Um, then the other question, I have a few EAB infested trees. How should I best deal with tree plant material to lessen the risks of other ash trees on my property that are not showing any signs of infestation? Um, there is, again, there on the emeraldashboard.info website, on the, on the home page, there is a, a very good publication, um, the insecticide options for homeowners uh, dealing with um, EAB. I think if you, that would probably give you a good idea on what to do, um, things like removing the infested ash trees or whether or not you, you could also treat them to, and that kind of thing. But that would give you probably the best information from the experts that would that, and you can make your decision after looking at those options. Okay, I have been asked to put up the website again. Um, you want me to stop sharing? Oh no, that's fine. It, I, I'm going to put it up in the Q and A pod. Is where I'm going to put that. 
um, and that should be in there. Let's see. Okay, now are the 60% of blue ash that are not killed by EAB, are they still severely damaged? Um, I don't know if I, I don't know anything about that one. So. Yeah, this is um, just reading that the paper from uh, Dan Herms, just skimming it real quickly here. Uh, yes, yeah, so they're saying that they, they appeared healthy. Uh, the 60% that survived, they, they appeared healthy. So it seems like there might be some resistance in, in the blue ash, but that's, um, again, this paper's a little bit, a little bit dated. This is back in 2011 that they did that part of it. So it seems like the ones that aren't killed seem to be surviving, um, but I think we need to take a closer look at that. But right as of now, that's the only, only ash tree that, that we find here normally that shows some resistance. Okay. Cliff, Cliff Sadoff, who is our other EAB, entomology expert um, has said treat the trees to protect them and a revision of the bulletin that I just mentioned there is going to be an update coming out in May. Um, let's see is there a minimum diameter of tr ash tree for that will be infested? Um, not really. <laughs> um, I've seen EAB in small trees, I've seen them in big trees. It kind of depends on what the population of EAB is in the area but they'll pretty much go after anything. And the, the only thing I saw, and this was in Dan Herm's paper, was that um, everything they're looking over an inch in diameter is what seems to be killed. And so I don't know if they just, they don't, they don't go after the little ones or the little ones can resist for a while, but it just seems like that's the, that's the only thing I've seen in terms of size. But other than that, they, they get everything. Okay. Cliff, Cliff also says that blue ash resistance is real with other with other paper and I, with in other papers by Dr. McCullough. So again, they probably very well will be on the Emerald Ash info website. Let's see. I think we are good here. Okay. Well, the minute I say that, the minute I say that, I'm waiting for another one to pop up. Yeah, <laughs> I'll definitely provide my, my contact information if there's additional questions. I said I can either answer or I will, I will get them, uh, find the answer for them. Okay. I do have one question here. Is, is it known what chemical or pheromone that attracts the EAB to the ash tree? Um, the, uh, researchers are still working on what volatiles attract them. Um, it doesn't seem to be a pheromone. EAB are more attracted to each other once they're on the ash tree than before. Um, they're not like, um, thing, you know, like the fruit tree, um, uh, some of the fruit tree press, pests and that kind of thing. Let's see, if a, if, if a tree has been infested for one year, would chemical tr treatment still be worthwhile if the systemic chemicals kill off all EAB, but would the structural integrity of the tree be compromised? Couple, couple of questions. It's a, it's, a, it's a good ask. So the first part is that, you know, so if you know that the uh, insect is in the tree, does it make sense to treat it? That's a, an economic decision or business decision. Uh, a lot of times we look at high value trees. You know, we have some here on our uh, corporate campus that, that we treat because it's their high value. So you'd have to look at that, the economic impact of that. Um, does whoever is writing the check feel that it is worth that? And, and sometimes the answer is yes, sometimes it's no. Um, the other piece is that, it, the other part of the question, if I heard you right, is that if we do treat it and it is effective and kills off the insects, what, what damage is left? Um, what, the, what I've seen and heard from the research is that as long as the, the tree is still um, healthy enough, the tree will can get past there now, like as you know, a tree is a you know a wounds a wound. So if there's some decay in some spot, the tree hopefully might um, grow past it or, or you know wall it off. It just depends on the nature of the infestation. And the key here is to think about that there's a lot more going on um, underneath the bark than we realize just looking at the outside. So hope I got both of your questions. Okay. Ah, oh, let's see. Are the symptoms the same for fringe trees as with ash trees? 
Oh, and I also have an, uh, another update from Cliff. Um, trees can be saved after they are infested. 30% thinning is the rule of thumb. 30% I think are less, or less can be saved. All right, um, the symptoms are the same for fringe trees as with ash. As far as I know, they are. I mean, you would still look for the D-shaped D, D holes, um, uh, you know, exit holes. You would still be looking for the bark splits and the S-shaped galleries underneath the bark and that kind of thing. It would pretty much be the same kind of thing. So I hope that helps. Um, it is, a, is it, okay. Okay, I answered that one. Okay, let's see if there's more. It looks like there's more. That's okay. <laughs> <laughs> I allowed myself an extra half an hour knowing that we might likely go. <laughs> okay. At what level of pest pressure does EAB attack blue ash? Also, does the Manchurian ash become invasive as well? I'm just skimming on the, on the yeah. blue ash. Uh, I, hold on here. Um, well, the one reference here in, in Dan's paper talks about a site that had blue ash and white ash um, in the same location, and the white ash were killed off, and the blue ash, only 40% were killed. So I, I, what I read and, and interpret from this is that the, the insect, and, and, and you alluded to this, Robin, it seems like the insect finds a tree visually, um, and then they find each other through some sense of, of smell or pheromone. Um, but I think that they will go after any ash tree and it just depends on you know, whether or not the tree can survive the attack. So it looks like in this one site, the green ash survived, 60% of them survived where 99% of the white ash were killed. Okay, I am going to give Cliff, hi Cliff. Uh, hi, I'm on, okay. <laughs> so I, he's the man that can answer some of these questions yeah, about no, the, the these are and the trees. These are great questions. Uh, you know, I know they're, 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 I know they're a little bit out of Tim's uh, uh, area over here, but uh, you know, what you've done on this uh, information about what uh, this tree structure, I mean, it's just, it's just, just phenomenal stuff. But it turns out there've been some common garden studies that have been done uh, by Dan McCulloch, uh, where uh, they were looking at the number of eggs that were being laid. And, and really, they're just generally not preferred by the emerald ash borer. And pretty much when all the other uh, preferred host trees are, have been uh, uh, utilized, then they, then they will start to attempt to attack the, uh, the, the blue ash trees. And uh, the, the, sometimes the blue ash trees will wall them off and kill, and, and kill the larvae so that they, and the trees are able to withstand the attack. And, the, and you know, Deb has done a, a, a work in a couple of papers where, you know, she's been looking at the densities of the, of the green ash versus the densities of the white ash and how that interacts to cause a lot of pressure. But basically, you could just assume that the blue ash will be, uh, will be attacked, but they are more than likely to be able to withstand the attack. You know, and uh, like Tim said, if they are in a, in a city where they're in a poor site and there, there's a lot of water stress, they're going to be less able to withstand the attack than if they are in, in, in a good site where there's lots of places for the roots uh, to grow and they get plenty of moisture and sunlight. Oh, good. Thank you. Additional questions? Yeah, um, we have one from Bill Gunther. What is the current cost per diameter inch to chemically treat an ornamental? The chemical? The cost to... Chemically treat an ornamental tree. Uh, <laughs> or EAB, I guess. I'm going to do the one, two, three, not it game. My finger's now on my nose. <laughs> okay, all right. Okay, not it. Okay. So, uh, <laughs> well, you know, the thing is, it's... Um, if uh, you know it depends which chemical you're going to be using how big the tree is if you have a tree with a diameter of less than a foot in diameter less than 12 inches you know uh you could probably treat it yourself with with one of the neonics like a midichlorid uh can work pretty well it costs about uh 30 bucks for a quart which would be about enough to treat a 10 inch diameter tree uh and once you do it once a year in the springtime but if you're using the mmectin benzoate uh, that's going to be treated uh, by a professional, and that can run anywhere between ten to uh, twenty dollars, depending on where you are per inch of diameter. 
So a 10 inch tree would be, if it's $20, it would be $200 to treat a 10 inch tree. But you get three inches, three years worth of protection from it. And in some places, uh, the price is considerably lower, like 15. Great. Well, I appreciate you, Cliff, coming on and being able to answer some of these questions. Um, and Tim, this has been great. I mean, this has been a lot of, um, you know, information that, that a lot of people are going to be able to use. And so I'm, I'm really happy that you agreed to do your presentation with us and, um, uh, and be, in, be involved here with Emerald Ashbury University. So with that, um, I'm going to close the meeting. Um, and again, thanks to Tim and Cliff for coming on and, and helping out with this great presentation. It is being recorded and will be available probably in a couple of days um, on the emeraldashbor.info website on the EAB University page. Well, thank you for the opportunity. Yes, thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. This was great.